Okay, good morning. I'm Jay Rasmussen, faculty development coordinator at Bethel. And, uh, we're thrilled to welcome you to this uh, session today. This is prime time at the BU Library. So if you're just coming in, we've got more seats in the back here. These are like the 200 to $250 seats. There's a couple of $150 seats right in the middle there. But uh, now we've got a great group here. That's wonderful. We're actually going to start just a couple minutes early, and I think everybody's just ready to hear what these guys have to say. So it should be a good time. Uh, Primetime is designed to celebrate the experiences and accomplishments of Bethel faculty, students, and staff. It's a collaborative project between the Friends of the BU Library, faculty development, and other offices on campus. We record most of the programming, and you can find recordings in the BU Digital Library. Today's presentation is also a live pod podcast, and you'll be given more information on how to access this and other podcasts in the series during the presentation. On September 29th, Scott Kaihai, reference and instructional librarian and our uh, campus copyright liaison, will review the copyright ex uh, exceptions and exemptions available to educators um, in the course of their teaching, also taking a closer look at fair use in the current digital climate. Today, we're discussing one of the most interesting political races in the history of, in the history of the United States with Drs. Andrews Bramson, uh, Mitchell Crum, Chris Moore of Political Science, and Assistant Professor Sam Mulberry, History. The presentation is entitled Election Shock Therapy. Welcome. Thanks. I shall not see, and I will not accept, the nomination of my party for another term at your present. Tear down this wall. And the wall just got ten feet tall. We go to California, and Texas, and New York, we go to South Dakota, and Oregon, and Washington, and Michigan, and then we go to Washington, D.C., and we're going to the White House. Welcome to Election Doc Shock Therapy, uh, this time not in my tiny cramped office, but live in the Bethel University Library. Um, if you're here joining us, could you please just give a quick shout? Hi, hey, everybody. Hi. Hi. You're now internet famous. <laughs> What's that? That's our proof that it's live. That's proof that's live. <laughs> proof of life. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm Chris Moore, assistant Profe or associate professor of political science. I'm Andy Bramson, assistant professor of political science. And I'm Mitchell Crum, also an assistant professor of political science. And I'm Sam Mulberry from the History Department, and my job is mostly to hit record. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. Sam keeps us honest. Uh, a couple of announcements as we get started here. Um, uh, we do have a very nice, uh, very thankful for this audience that's come to participate with us today. They are submitting questions live in real time. Sam is our gatekeeper for those. He's reviewed some of those, and he's going to throw them at us a little bit later on today. Uh, before we get started, too, though, um, if you have questions, you can always send them to us. Uh, you can email us at electionshocktherapy at gmail.com. And we'll take some questions there, questions we don't get to today, uh, we will also address in future podcasts. Also, uh, the, uh, um, we are uh, looking forward to, in conjunction with Duff University Student Life and the Political Science Department's Honorary Pi Sigma Alpha and a few other players, uh, we're looking at uh, getting an election night party going. So now, uh, more announcements on that as it comes forward, but we're going to be doing something probably, probably live again on election night. Um, to either celebrate or commiserate, and maybe a little bit of both. <laughs> also, if you'd help us uh, 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 tweak the algorithm on iTunes, we'd love it if you could rate us on iTunes. Give us a five-star rating, if you would, please, and review us. Uh, that helps other people find us. Uh, so let's mess with their algorithm. Uh, thank you all for those announcements. All right, gentlemen, news of the day. What are you watching right now? Uh, this morning I saw that there are uh, new revelations that Trump uh, used his charity to basically fund various uh, enterprises in his business. So apparently he was fined uh, over 150 grand and actually used the Trump Foundation uh, to write that check. So that just broke this morning. The Washington Post sent that out. Interesting. Yeah, I guess I was looking at the most recent uh, police shooting in Tulsa and kind of wondering how that's going to play out in the um, political race. I have not seen what either Trump or Hillary has said in terms of reacting to that. But it's going to certainly keep this narrative of um, this kind of injustice uh, at the forefront of the discussion. Do you think that's going to come up in the debates? It could. Yeah, I don't. I don't, I don't know. It's will will the debate moderators want to bring it up with with them? I don't know. And it's a tough issue too because it's a it, it does get. I mean, like, what what can a presidential candidate and what can a president ultimately really do about this? Um, because you really are talking about local law enforcement, right? And so the president actually has limited power in this 
our current president has discovered in trying to, you know, in watching this unfold, but finding himself really rather limited in terms of his ability to impact it. We, uh, we often have a president who serves, we've, we've, uh, Teddy Roosevelt famously talked about the bully pulpit, but we often have a president who serves as a moral leader in chief for the country. Uh, with two presidential candidates as deeply unpopular as Clinton and Trump are, even as they're running for president, um, that might be a role that they have sort of limited interest in pursuing at this point, or, or limited ability to access. Um, I agree. I'm, uh, I, I wanted to talk about uh, Lester Holt, who's going to be the moderator for the first debate, or, or less than a week away from the first debate. By the looks on your faces, I can tell you're excited. Um, um, and uh, it's going to be next Monday. Uh, he's announced his topics. The topics, uh, there's three topics. They are exceedingly vague. Um, they are making America prosperous, making America secure, and, um, oh, they really are so stultifying, I've forgotten the third one. Do you think um, great again? No, I don't think so. I think it's close to one candidate. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll see where they go with this, but it doesn't seem likely they're going to bring up sort of law enforcement issues and specifically uh, uh, police shootings as a result of those two topics. Um, other news this week, the one that struck me, um, President Obama, or excuse me, uh, President Obama, according to Donald Trump, is in fact born in the United States. Yes. After what saying is. Five years now, his, his, his research is concluded, um, and we've, we've worked, he's confirmed he's, he's been born here. So. Yeah. And Hillary started this story. That's now the Trump campaign. He's just resolving the issue that the Clinton campaign brought up in 2008. So, <laughs> so, so what, it, what is the, I always like to ask you guys questions about kind of the strategy of um, why come up with that now? Um, Good, why come out with that now? <laughs> You're asking us to plumb the mind of Trump. Though. Yeah, that's, no, absolutely though. I, you know, because like, like, what, what is the? Um, is there something advantageous about this particular timing? Or I mean, you guys seem to be implying it's random, but I'm presuming it's not. I think. Oh, go ahead, please. No, I was going to say. I, mean, I think one of the one of the reasons that Trump uh, has to. Uh, essentially, bring this up now is there's nothing to lose. I mean, at this point, um, it's not. It's no longer about President Obama, and so he may as well say that. And once again, you know, by saying it, he put himself in the news. And so, you know, this is constantly a game for him of how can he once again grab the headlines. And just as basically Hillary Clinton is coming back um, uh, on the campaign trail, he's trying to once again uh, draw the narrative back to himself, and he's successfully done that. And I think it also. I, I agree with that. And I think it also kind of clears the deck of an issue that. Maybe he doesn't want to talk about too much anymore. So you kind of, you know, make yourself look as good as possible. Um, that whatever you know, falsehoods were there, you at least are trying to, you know, share them with Hillary Clinton. Um, this is really her fault. She started the story. I was just trying to resolve it. And then he can kind of move on to issues that he thinks are probably more advantageous. So I think, as far as there's a, a strategic element, that's kind of how I see it. Is your sense there. is your sense that that will be effective? That we will just he says that, so then we move on, or do you think this is going to linger, or? I think it had to be done. I think he had to do this to kind of clear the ground, if only for internal Republican Party cohesiveness, uh, to get uh, otherwise moderate uh, party leader types, um, <laughs> Paul Ryan's, uh, to be more comfortable campaigning for and endorsing him. He had to get rid of this sort of the, the birther connection thing. Um, will it be brought back up? Um, he did an odd thing by trying to tie Hillary Clinton to this to this longstanding uh, rumor he's been pursuing. And doesn't that then make? The story go long. I mean, if the if the yeah. idea is to get to sort of put this in the past, doesn't that also then push it forward? I mean, a different way, but I think so. I, I think that was an odd move on his part. Yeah, so. and his surrogates, I mean, had trouble kind of defending his position. Even his campaign manager went on, and they sort of, you know, the I forget which journalist was interviewing her, but it was, the journalist was trying to push her on this, and and you know, they're like, well, isn't this a problem? He's telling you the story that's been sort of repeatedly bumped that this really is has its roots in Hillary Clinton. And, you know, finally she just was like, well, you'll have to ask him, right? I mean, like, like, basically, I don't want to defend this, this position anymore. So yeah, it may, it may not work to go away. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, this feels like a really dead, tired issue. We're talking about the, the citizenship of the person who's been president for the last seven years and eight months, right? I mean, like, I think most of us have kind of moved on from that issue. So, you know, I don't know how much life you can get out of it before he gets to move on from it. And that way he's kind of clear the decks. He just says, you know what? I've admitted he's a citizen. Let's not talk about this. So it gets hard to push it. All right, well, one of the reasons we gather today is to talk specifically about um, the role of our faith and uh, our participation in politics. 
Uh, this is an interesting election for people of faith. Uh, those of you listening online, Bethel uh, uh, University is a uh, evangelical institution, uh, um, and uh, we take our faith and integration of faith and scholarship around here very seriously. Um, these are two candidates that have uh, not inspired the evangelical community. Um, uh, 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 Hillary Clinton um, uh, um, hails from the Methodist faith, um, but holds policy positions that uh, the last four decades or so have been um, uh, off-putting to evangelicals. Donald Trump um, has not had much of a faith background in his life, uh, but has recently, according to uh, some evangelical leaders like James Dobson, uh, become a baby Christian, which uh, is what you talk about what that means too. Uh, but um, how do Christians, and in particular, how do evangelicals integrate faith into their political lives? Well, I'll kind of lead off thinking about this and so um, and give a shameless plug at the same time. So on Thursday night, uh, if you want to hear a lot more about this topic, about sort of how, why and how we as Christians should engage politics, I'm part of a roundtable discussion at Church of the Cross over at Hopkins, Minnesota, so feel free to, to join us there. It's from 7 to 9 p.m. Um, so if you're in the cities, please do join us if you want. Um, but one of the things I'll be talking about is sort of this issue of why we should engage and what that should look like for us. And I think one, one way I think about our engagement, obviously as a political scientist, I do think we have to be engaged in politics, uh, so I'll sort of put that out there to start with. But I think, uh, you know, our engagement as Christians should look different, right? And so we shouldn't play by the same um, rules of the game that others play by. And so what I mean by that it's is, a higher standard. it's a higher standard, right? But I think we should think about things like, I mean, when we, when we are relating to government, right? Um, we think about sort of the scriptures that tell us submit to government's authority just as you submit to God's authority. What does that mean for us, right? What does that mean when the government isn't particularly good, right? When we disagree with its policies. And, and how should it play in that, you know, when Paul writes those words to the Romans, right, in Romans 13, he's telling this to people who are under the government of Nero, which was a really unfriendly government, right? I mean, we might have some disagreements with um, Barack Obama's administration or Mark Gates' administration, but they're not burning Christians in their gardens, right? So, I mean, there's a, there's a lot to be said for, for these administrations compared to the one um, that Paul's writing under, right? So, so what does it mean to submit to that authority? And then also thinking about sort of our role in the political sphere, I mean, one thing I always think of is as we seek peace in this earthly city, right, to use Augustine's terms, um, you know, we should always be pointing people to the greater peace, right? And so saying, you know, like, yes, we're trying to seek um, to make our society better, but ultimately we want to point people to the reality um, that they're supposed to have this right relationship with Christ, and that's the, the greater peace we should be pointing to. And so as we do all that, I guess the, the biggest sort of takeaway I have in terms of thinking about our, our politics and how we should engage it is that we, we have to be held to a higher standard, right? We have to think about the fact that although these ends we are seeking are worthwhile, we can't use any means to get there, right? And so when you look at sort of political leaders, people get frustrated by it. It's just sort of like you do whatever you have to do to accomplish your goals. And I think as Christians, we have to hold ourselves to a higher standard and say, you know what? Um, what kind of means are appropriate uh, for me as a Christian to engage in? What, which ones are not? Um, and to, to reflect deeply on that. So uh, when I was thinking about how, uh, what I was going to say, one of the things that comes frequently when I think about why I study politics and why I think about uh, political science is because I care about uh, truth. And you know, as Christians, a lot of times we, we say, well, we have the truth, we want to think about truth. Uh, but one of the areas where truth so easily and so often gets lost is in politics itself. I mean, as we see in the campaign season here, we once again have lots of accusations and also lots of pretty, um, pretty, pretty pretty sure cases of people not telling the truth. And so one of the things that I want to... <laughs> That's very true. Is very true. true. We, we have some obvious lines. <laughs> so um, but I think in politics, especially when the stakes are so high and you have so much power um, involved, that's usually uh, where, where, where people are led. And in fact, if you read some of the ancients, you know, even Plato himself said, you know, sometimes that's actually good. You need people in power to be willing to lie if it's for good ends. You, know, you need the noble lie. But I think as Christians, we need to come at this from a different perspective. We need to say that, no, truth always matters. And I think that's one of the reasons why I think political science is so important is because we are con part of what I see our vocation is doing is constantly trying to say, how can we understand the truth about what's happening despite the fact that we have power, despite the, we, the fact that we have so much uh, incentive to be deceptive, despite the fact that a lot of people want to deceive. How can we somehow still penetrate to get to the truth? And I think that's in many ways what, if you read, if, if, if we look at the Bible, that's in many ways what Christians and what uh, disciples of Jesus are constantly trying to do. Even in the Old Testament, 
you know, we think about the prophets and what the prophetic role was. The prophets weren't there um, most of the time telling, foretelling the future. Most of the time what they were doing is they were saying, this is the truth. They were telling the present. <laughs> they were telling the present. They were saying, this is the truth about the situation right now. You have these problems. You want to deny that you have these problems. You want to you know, look in these other directions, but this is where things are right now. And I think in some ways, you know, obviously we're not prophetic in that sense, but in many ways we want to carry forward and say, how can we tell the truth right now? And I think that's, uh, it, 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 for us as Christians, that should be one of our main goals. And I think that's, in, in some ways, just to sort of bring it back to the present, why this current election is so troubling. We have a lot of people who seem to be willing to justify um, and to equivocate on a lot of things that have to do with the truth um, when it comes to politics in the name of forwarding Christian interests. And I think what we need to do as Christians is we need to be very careful that what we are focused on is the truth and that we want to forward and that we only want to speak the truth even when those don't necessarily forward our ends and our goals. I also add one little thing there to that. I think that's really uh, very well put, Mitchell. And what I'd add too is we always have to think about in terms of our identity. What what is our identity, right? Um, and it's easy for us to think about our identity as Americans or our, our identity as Republicans or Democrats, right? Um, and, and those are not unimportant, right? And I'm not knocking those identities, but we have to always remember that our primary identity must be found in Christ. And so anytime we find ourselves um, sacrificing our identity in Christ for the sake of some earthly political goal, um, it's fair to say we've gotten off where we should be, right? And we need to get back and reorient ourselves um, to remember our primary identity is in Christ and the other things need to be subjugated to that, um, not the other way around. And so to Mitchell's point, I think too often what we see is that people sort of forget that in the heat of political battle um, and they, they get their identities out of order as Christians. Well, let me ask you uh, two gentlemen, and then Sam too, perhaps, the hard question here, which is, uh, Andy, you talked about uh, Christians sort of uh, being subject to a higher standard in their political participation. And then you talked about uh, <coughs> Christian pursuit of the truth. Is there ever a point at which we say that the, the nature of the political discourse is so fallacious and so misrepresentative that Christians must accept themselves out of it? Uh, is there, are, we, are we approaching a standard by which Christians say that we ought not participate in the political process? I wouldn't go that far. Um, I wouldn't say you sort of completely recuse yourself, but I think it might change the nature of your participation. What what kinds of form, you know, what, what forms of participation are appropriate? What forms are just going to fundamentally compromise you? And so I think, I mean, to the point about the you know our identity being found in Christ, right, we have to think about you know, that's got to be primary. And so any any kind of participation that would sacrifice that then I think we do need to step back and say we can't do that. Um, I, I tend to think in our system, most of the time, you can engage on those terms or, you know, and, and say, you know, here's my primary identity, I'm still going to engage. On the other hand, will that make you less effective in some instances? And the answer is probably yes. I mean, um, the reality is like the, the passage our pastor preached on on Sunday was the parable of the unjust steward. And, you know, the, idea that this, the, the sons of darkness are more shrewd than the sons of light. And there's a real sense in which that's true, right? I mean, um, that this does disadvantage us, right? We can't say um, false things about people when we engage in politics. And sometimes false things work, right? Um, so I think that we can still engage. But understand, you may be sacrificing efficacy for the sake of, of truth and of following Christ. And, and, I, and I would argue you should. You should sacrifice efficacy in those instances. If you're following Christ. Right, absolutely. Yeah. If I could just sort of uh, follow up on that. I mean, one of the things that I think oftentimes we look back on the presidency of Jimmy Carter as being a failure. But I think one of the reasons that we think of him as a failure is because he told the truth as he saw it. You know, you look at Jimmy Carter and he actually looked out and he said, you know, there's a lot of problems. You know, you sort of watch him as he goes through his, his uh, presidency and he sort of gets more and more weathered and sort of torn down with the burdens of what's going on around him and all the problems in world office. And I think part of what made him ineffective was, in, was the fact that he uh, actually told the truth. And I think that was part of his, you know, agree or disagree with his policies. I think that, in that sense, was sort of his Christian uh, faith coming through. He felt like he needed to be honest, and he needed to say uh, what he felt as he saw them. I think I'll add, just as a coda to this conversation, I'm going to transition to a, another component of it. Um, we know that different, uh, 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 different parts of Christendom approach political engagement in different ways. And one of the reasons I asked the two of you about uh, whether you thought it was appropriate or that ever might be a time that Christians would accept themselves in the political process, is we do have Christians who intentionally accept themselves in the political process. Uh, Anabaptists avoid political participation for the very reasons that we're talking about here, that the, the corruptive nature of the power of the system of the world is itself problematic. 
Um, and, but, we have, but most other denominations, most Christians, and find a justification or, or a means or a methodology by which we engage in politics, whether it's uh, Catholic social theory or whether it's uh, Luther's two kingdoms, or, f or sort of a fused paradox, um, or whether it's uh, uh, the idea of, of, of common and specialized, special grace out of the Reformed tradition, which our colleague was here, we can talk about that. Um, and, uh, or, or others, or different, different denominations find justifications and means and methodologies by which we engage in politics. And evangelicalism is part of that as well, although it's seen its own transition. Uh, if we were having this conversation back in the 50s, um, we wouldn't be podcasting it, first of all. Uh, <laughs> but also, um, evangelicals would be very, very skeptical of political participation. And by the 80s, uh, with the rise of the moral majority, and uh, in the 90s with the Christian coalition, and now uh, evangelicals are very politically engaged and very politically tied to one side of the political spectrum. Um, and I think that's a, that's a transition, something that we should grapple with and not just assume. Let me talk about, let me ask you gentlemen, um, so we talk about truth, pursuing truth, but how about grace? Uh, how, how, how ought Christians be civil in the political discourse? Uh, we, we, have a, we, we feel like civility is a call of ours, but is there justification for it and are there limits to it? So uh, when, we, when we think about civility, I think there are sort of two sides to this. Um, on, on the one hand, you know, when you think, uh, civility uh, is, is important because, uh, well, on the, one hand, on the one hand, civility can be defined as simply politeness. In other words, we want to be sort of engage in whatever norms are in our culture about being nice to each other and sort of Minnesota uh, maybe Minnesota <laughs> nice, yeah. I'm a newcomer here, but this is yeah. So anyway, so 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 one thing I might think of that. Anyway, so we so we might think of it as just in just in terms of being nice. But part of the problem uh, that, that we run into is those definitions sort of vary as far as what we think um, politeness means. And so what, what I usually think of or what I want to think of when I think of civility is, is uh, what does it mean to, uh, you know, as Christians especially, what does it mean to love the other person? How can I uh, speak in such a way that will reach them, that will be effectual to them, that will not be harmful to them in that way? And I think, you know, if we read, especially, you know, like Paul in Ephesians, he says, you know, we need to, you know, how can, how can we speak the truth essentially without being, without, without engaging in wrath, without having bitterness, without having um, some of these things? And I think, um, you know, in sort of general terms, that's more, the aim of civility. It's not necessarily just being nice, it's how can I do this in love? Because it might mean saying uncomfortable things. You know, I think Nathan, when he went to David, you know, he was he was civil, you know, when, when he went to David, but he was telling him, uh, you've done something really, really wrong. And so I think I think that's an example of civility. And I think that cuts to the other side. There are you know where civility runs up against limits where we might think of and maybe this is not limits, maybe it's just another part of the definition. But we also need to be thinking about, you know, civility can't stop you from speaking what is true. And I think, you know, essentially if, you know, sometimes I think what politicians object to, and I think we're seeing this, uh, you know, as we go into this campaign, is they say, well, I don't want to talk about that. How dare you bring up this thing or that thing? You know, you're being uncivil by bringing this aspect of, of my past or something like that into politics, when in fact that's simply part of your record. That's simply part of the truth. That's not uncivil to bring that in. That's just what's there, just like Nathan coming to David. Right, I, I think that's, um, I totally agree with that. And we had a couple things. I mean, one is, um, so this all, all this discussion makes me think a little bit of one of our Bethel buzzwords, right? Which is this idea that we should have an irenic spirit, right? For those um, who are not part of our, our yeah. body here, we mean irenic with an E, not ironic with an O. Right, that's a key <laughs> distinction. And by the way, I have to confess, and I hope this doesn't harm me with um, any of my colleagues in the, in the audience here, but I have to confess, before I got a job at Bethel, I didn't actually know the word irenic. But after I got here, I learned that word. Uh, it's a really important word. And it turns out it means something along the lines of disagreeing without being disagreeable. Right? And so being able to have those hard conversations, being able to talk about truths that are sometimes uncomfortable, as Mitchell put it, um, while at the same time, right, still saying, you know what, we have a relationship, and we can talk about these things, and we can end up on different sides, and we can still be good friends and colleagues, right, um, and followers of Christ. And so I think that that's a, a sort of an important way for us as, as Christians um, to think about the way we engage. The other thing I would say to this issue of the balance between truth and grace is I've just been teaching uh, Plato's Republic in my humanities class. And in, in the Republic, one of the challenges they sort of wrestle with the idea of uh, what constitutes justice, right? Um, you know, there's this idea that maybe justice is just the advantage of the stronger, that justice is just a farce, right? There's no real such thing. Um, and, and Socrates, Plato Socrates, pushes back against this and says, you know, um, that there, he thinks there is a real core to the idea of justice. 
right? And when Thrasymachus is arguing, like, injustice is better, it's, you know, it's going to be more successful. He says, but how do you make justice, right? Uh, how do you make someone just? You can't make them just through injustice, right? That is a sort of contradiction. So if we think about sort of how we pursue a better society uh, politically, right, in this country, uh, we're not going to get there by unjust means, right? We're not going to get there by sort of, you know, sort of taking injustice and using that to try to achieve justice. That is almost always going to be a sort of contradictory uh, project. Right? Two so, wrongs don't make a um, right. Two wrongs don't make a right. And when you sort of build things on these sort of unjust premises, then it's usually going to end up in injustice. So, um, so again, just a little insight from play with uh, The only thing I'll add, I, gentlemen, is that um, oftentimes when uh, we talk about <laughs> civility in public life in the United States, we tend to have sort of a um, a view of civility, which is first do no harm. As long as I don't offend someone else, as long as I don't cause them grievance, as long as I'm nice to them, I, I've done my job in terms of being civil. But I would actually argue that if, if Andy talked earlier about being held to a higher standard, Christians have a role of, for civility that goes beyond merely being nice uh, or merely not causing offense, but in some ways building the dialogue. Um, I've been reading some philosophers recently who argued that the, the key fundamental notion of democracy is that the dialogue doesn't stop, the conversation doesn't end, the debate can continue. And if that's the case, then I think Christians have a uh, call to act in such a way as to allow the conversation to continue, to, to foster and encourage the debate. And in that way, I think we, we're taking civility beyond merely being nice and being openly and intentionally engaging with, with alternative points of view. All right. Um, I have nothing to say about it. <laughs> <laughs> You're just going to say about That's right. Okay, all right. Well, it's for um, a different show. Well, thanks for, uh, thanks for listening to us on, on uh, talking about civility and faith and politics. Uh, what we'd like to do now is turn some questions to the audience, and Sam's been assiduously collecting questions here. If you have other questions, we'd like to submit those to us. We'll take a few more at this time. Again, if we don't get to all of these, uh, we will um, uh, we'll be able addressing those in future podcasts as well. I'll say this is the most fun part for me because this is normally on the podcast. I get to be the one who um, just gets all of my questions answered. And these are uh, pretty interesting guys to answer questions or to ask questions to. So um, I'm going to start with a couple questions about the debates. Okay. Um, so the first comes from John in Arden Hills, Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of these are local questions. <laughs> uh, so, so I'm going to read two questions here uh, attached to the debate. So first, uh, do you believe that Gary Johnson should be able to debate uh, how is it? Um, how does it affect current candidates uh, that he's pull, that his polling uh, might be higher than other third parties have? And then, secondly, um, do presidential debates make a significant difference in the outcome of elections? What does history suggest? So, some general questions about debate. Uh, so, on the one hand, uh, there's, there's, I just want to note that there is sort of a should in the, in the first part. <laughs> so, it's should should Gary Johnson uh, be allowed be allowed to debate and there, there are a number of different ways we might approach uh, that, that sort of a should. Um, on the one hand, I'm going to hold you down. Should he? Yeah. <laughs> on, the, on the one hand, we could say, you know, does he meet sort of the standards that have been set by the election commission? And obviously, the answer is no. He hasn't reached the 15% um, average polling threshold um, to be in there. But I don't think that's really what the question is. <laughs> so the question is, what does? If, if I if I can sort of speculate, the question is more along the lines of, uh, what, what what does it mean for democracy? Um, uh, and, 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 for, and for voting, the fact that he's not included. And in that case, I think it depends on what you want the debates to be. Um, on the one hand, the debates could be a situation where only, you know, where, where basically you're only seeing presented the two candidates who have a reasonable chance of winning. And for, you know, there's, they're, they're, uh, you know, I don't want to get into why that's the case, but there really are only two candidates who have a reasonable chance of winning, and it's Trump and Hillary. And so if you want to have the debate that is purely there to help people make their decision on how they're going to vote based on these two candidates, one of whom will be president, um, barring something really significant, um, then, then, then in that case, no. Um, you know, Johnson has no realistic chance of winning, and so he shouldn't be included, because the debate should be about, um, you know, who is actually going to be president. On the other hand, if you take another sort of view of democracy and you say, well, what these debates are really about is not really choosing who you're going to vote for. It's about sort of airing different views on policies, and we should have more perspectives. And you know, sort of to get you know, sort of use. I've been talking about this stuff recently, so this is on my mind. You know, if you sort of use Aristotle's metaphor of the of the potluck, right, where you have more, the more you know, everybody who brings different dishes, you know, so you want more. The more you have, the better meal you're going to have. 
then uh, you know, then uh, and so and so if you have that sort of view, then yes, we should have Gary Johnson, we should probably have Jill Stein, and maybe uh, even some others, right? We should maybe get six or seven because there's probably lots of different views. But then that's going to sort of raise the question of where do you where do you cut it off? Like how many views um, should be out there and should be spoken um, in a presidential debate? I presume the NCAA selection committee. Right. So yeah. So okay. Yeah. Maybe we're gonna have. You know. Yeah. So 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 in that case, you know, I think that sort of gets to the problem. What do you what do you think the debates are supposed to be? If they're supposed to present lots of different views, then yes, he should be included. Um, and I'll just say, you know, since you said you wanted to pin me down at the end, I don't think that's what the debates are about. I think they're about the first thing. I think they're about who are you going to vote for. In that case, I think no, uh, it should just be the two candidates who have a reasonable chance of winning, which is Trump and Hillary. And to the other part of John's question, I mean, how does, how does Gary Johnson impact this race with the other pieces sort of burden there? I do think, I mean, he potentially, and he and both he and Jill Stein, and possibly even other candidates, um, you know, could have a real impact in this race. One of the interesting things we've talked about on this podcast before is that, you know, we have two candidates with historically high negatives, and people really don't like either of these candidates very much, right? And so, uh, you know, people, it's, what's interesting, like, as Hillary's numbers have kind of dropped from the last week, or, or a couple weeks, rather, uh, one of the reasons that's happened is because the attention has been focused on her. People are reminded we don't really like Hillary Clinton all that much, right? And during parts of the race when the attention is focused on Donald Trump, people are reminded we don't really like Donald Trump all that much, right? So it kind of seems to depend on whoever they're focusing on, they're reminded how much they don't really like that person. Uh, so, so all I'd say, like, there's a lot of people who are in deep sort of reservations about both of these candidates in a way that really hasn't been true um, in you know other elections I've observed in my lifetime, right? So, uh, so that makes it for an opening, I think, for people like Gary Johnson and Jill Stein because there's it seems like there are some voters who are saying, you know what, I just find both of these candidates utterly unacceptable, so therefore I'm going to go vote. Uh, for one of these people. So having them in the debates, I mean, arguably would probably drive up those numbers. Um, but as Mitchell points out, I mean, like, it just doesn't seem to be any realistic chance that even if you, you include them, even if they drive up those numbers, that they can get over some of the huge advantages Republicans and Democrats have in this country. So I think, you know, in that sense, it makes sense to exclude them. Um, so, so sticking on the, the uh, theme of third party, we have two other questions about third party candidates. Um, one of them is from Zach, and he's clearly a listener to the show because he's referencing something from a previous episode. Oh, Zach, I'm so sorry. He says, on a previous episode, uh, Dr. Ramson mentioned that Gary Johnson has run a pretty disappointing campaign. Why is this, and what should he have done differently? And then another question uh, from Lorna. Do you think it's wise to vote for a third-party candidate in this election? Well, since, I, since Zach is funny, I guess I'll lead off here. Um, so Gary Johnson has run a disappointing campaign. What did I mean by that? So that the previous uh, podcast. I think what I was really getting at there is that I do see an opportunity for a third party candidate in this race in a way that I've never seen um, again in my, in my lifetime, right? Um, because the two candidates, the two major party candidates are viewed so negatively, this feels like if there was ever a chance for a third party candidate to get out there, catch fire, um, and really draw a lot of people behind his or her banner, right? This is that election. And Gary Johnson on paper looks like the kind of person who could do that. He's a two term former governor of a swing state, right? He's a Republican who holds, um, I mean, the background is Republican, um, who holds pretty liberal views on a number of issues, right? He feels like the kind of person who could draw people behind him and get quite a number of votes. And I think he will get a significant number of votes, but I don't think he's going to get anywhere close enough to, to threaten. And I think part of the reason is Johnson's just written kind of a clumsy campaign. He's not that inspiring as a speaker. Um, he said some things that have really hurt him. Um, he seems inconsistent. As in, he's a libertarian who doesn't seem consistently libertarian, uh, which again, in, in a race when you're, you know, people are getting bashed all the time for being inconsistent on this or that, or not telling the truth on this or that, um, also seems to hurt him. So I feel like if he had more charisma, he might have actually gotten this done. But he's just, when you listen to him, he's just not all that inspiring. Um, so I do think that this is, in that sense, a kind of a, a, a drop opportunity. Um, I could have imagined that being different. Is so. he going to do well enough in certain key states that he might swing the election? Um, places like Ohio and Florida, uh, Pennsylvania, perhaps? It could happen. I mean, I, I'm not convinced by any of the state polls I've seen so far that he's actually changing, right now, that he's changing the result. Um, he's maybe, you know, he's certainly driving down the percentage that the major party candidates get, but I'm not sure he's actually, you know, taking enough from one camp or the other to swing a state from Trump to Hillary or vice versa. Um, so, yeah, I'm not, it, it could happen, but I'm not convinced of that point. I want to address the, just briefly, the moral question. Um, is it ever is it a good idea to vote uh, for a third party candidate? 
And there's an argument for and, and an argument against, and I wouldn't be a good academic if I didn't give you both. Uh, so uh, the argument against voting for a third party candidate is basically what Andy just said. It's incredibly unlikely that a third party candidate would win. So you have an obligation to vote for the best possible candidate out of the two candidates that are most likely to win. And that is your, that's your duty. Is to, or to, if you prefer the more negative version of that, you have an obligation to vote against the person who would be the worst for the job. Um, but, uh, but that might not sit well with you. You might think, well, no, actually what I need to do is I need to represent with my vote the person who I think is best qualified for this job. And that might be a third party candidate. And even if that means that that person has no hope of winning, I need to signal uh, my favor towards them with my vote. And I think that's the argument in favor of voting for a third party candidate. Thank you. This, uh, this question comes from Caitlin. I think this is a really interesting question. Um, what is the significance, if any, of the fact that we call Trump by his last name and Hillary by her first. <laughs> well, this is partly, I mean, partly something Hillary herself has done because, it, I mean, of course, in case you didn't realize, um, she used to be our first lady. Uh, right? So uh, her husband was president. And so, you know, I think there's this sense in which she wants to establish her own identity. Um, and so, to me, that's part of why she's chosen uh, to go that route is to sort of not be too Clinton. Also, I mean, Hillary Clinton, interestingly enough, was not always known as Hillary Clinton. Right? I mean, so um, I was just old enough to remember um, that you know this was an issue in the 1992 uh, race, right? Where um, you know she would, she'd gone by her maiden name of Rodham, and as they as Bill Clinton ran for president, she sort of transitioned to using um, her married name more. But you know that wasn't always the case, right? So I think that sort of Hillary is sort of that that compromise. In some so she kind of does go with that. What's interesting about that is I mean Trump himself has sometimes you know gone by the Donald, right? So I mean, like you know so we could have certainly called him by his first name too. On the other hand, I mean the Trump branding. He tends to put his last name in very large letters on very large buildings. Yes, so it's hard to avoid. I mean, I was in Chicago this summer and walked by the, the Trump building. It is really, really a large uh, Trump, right? So he, um, yeah, he likes to use that. So, so I think that's why we've done that. But it's, you know, it's interesting. Um, here's an international relations question. Chris, okay. you're, you're an IR guy. Uh, based on, on international relations, if Trump becomes president and continues his erratic and immature ways, which country <laughs> would, he, would we be at most risk uh, in terms of conflict um, based on sort of his lack of tact and a filter? <laughs> that's a, that's, this is the, the question. I, sure. I, <laughs> uh, I, well, I, have, I have good news and, and bad news. The good news is uh, very rarely do countries insult each other into wars. Um, uh, although, inter recently, uh, President Obama declined to meet with the Philippine president because the Philippine president uh, referred to President Obama as a son of a whore. Um, uh, he also referred to the Pope by the same, using the same term in Filipino, so he's a, he's a pretty earthy guy. Um, I'll believe that that. But, so he so canceled a, a diplomatic visit. That's a long way between canceling a diplomatic visit and, and firing off some rockets. And um, I think it's unlikely that we would enter into a military conflict simply over purely erratic behavior. But I think uh, what it could do is it could it could harm alliances. Um, it could and it could it could um, motivate other other allies too, or other other I'm sorry other uh, adversaries in the international sphere. Um, if if adversaries think that Trump is erratic, uh, it might push them to take less risks. Um, Richard Nixon famously propagated this idea of a madman theory that if the president seemed a little unbalanced and a little shaky, that might make our enemies conservative and cautious because they didn't know how we'd lash out at them. Uh, in contrast, Trump has portrayed himself to be relatively isolationist, especially compared to Hillary Clinton, that he might be less willing to use force abroad than Clinton is. In that way, America might be less um, prone to use his military. Um, in our last episode, we talked a little bit about the qualifications for, for being president and how it's a pretty lean job description uh, in certain ways. Um, so, uh, so Joe asks, uh, it's not really an issue in this election since uh, Cruz lost in the primaries, but when should the Supreme Court rule on the constitutional definition of naturalized citizen? I remember asking you about natural this. Natural born citizen. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, natural born citizen. Yeah. When should the Supreme Court rule? Yes. Well, or, I, mean, well I, guess, I guess the question is, is um, should that be defined further? Is there a need for that to be defined further? Because that was clearly, in the primaries, that was clearly a question that was being asked. I, 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 I'm going to punt a little bit and see what you guys think. But I, my, my quick response would be, I would love to see us rule on that before we have a candidate who fits that role. You know, before Arnold Schwarzenegger runs for president, I would like to get this issue figured out. Because what we don't want 
is to have a very viable, very popular candidate who's not a natural born or not a native born U.S. citizen who wants to become president. That's a bad time to make that kind of ruling. But what, should this be something the Supreme Court rules on? Uh, I don't know that I have. I don't know that I have a strong, strong position on that one way or the other. Part of the part of the problem, I think, part of the reason that the court uh, hasn't ruled on this is because uh, it is well. Part of it is you know the Supreme Court almost needs a case, right? right. If you're going to have a rule on it, you know you actually have to have um, you know you, uh, the case actually has. Yeah, other, otherwise, the case is moot, right? Mm -hmm. So so to to avoid mootness, you actually need um, a candidate. And I think that's actually the main reason the court hasn't done it is because. Arnold Schwarzenegger hasn't run uh, for president. Um, uh, you know, it hasn't actually been something that they that they've had to rule on. Um, in many ways, maybe maybe you know whatever else you think of the Cruz campaign, maybe that would have been a case where the the, the that would have allowed the, the court to actually rule on this. Um, but until then, I don't think I don't think we're going to see it. Yeah, I agree. They, they can't really handle hypotheticals, and they they tended to. I mean, or, or the sort of you know legal system more broadly has tended to interpret pretty generously. So I mean, this was an issue with John McCain, right, who was actually not born on U.S. soil, he was born out of Panama, um, and so they tended to interpret it. You know, if, if there's reasonable case to be made for them being this person being a natural born citizen, so at least one American parent, um, born on American soil, and so forth, um, then they tend to interpret the soil the Panama Canal. So, Right, well, as long as you have an American parent, right? Sure. Like that's, the issue with like a Schwarzenegger would be that he wasn't born in the United States naturalized and, US and has no American parent. So that's a pretty, I think that, that would probably be pretty open and shut. But, but with most of the others, if, if there's some case for the person being um, natural born, they tended to define it that way. Um, and so I, mean, I think for the record, like, you know, Colin Cruz or Obama or McCain, um, you know, America, you know, natural born American citizens is pretty clearly the right call. Okay, our next question uh, comes from Jolene. Why are people so heavily focused on the general elections, national elections, when local politics has a major influence on the daily lives of individuals? Uh, I think I think this is actually in many ways often a problem. Um, you know, usually we we uh, I think I think the reason we do it is two reasons. Number one, uh, at least for the for the news media, it's easy. Um, if you look at the if you look at national politics, it's very easy to cover national politics because you essentially have. You know, one president, and then you have you know 535 members of Congress, and then you've got the Supreme Court. It's pretty easy to actually get people to go around and follow uh, what's going on in those institutions. I mean, some of it's difficult, but particularly here, presidency, right? It's basically, a reality show. Exactly. Yeah, you basically right. just assign somebody to you sit on the plane and follow them around, and that's and that's basically what that is. Um, I think when it comes to local politics, that's when it gets much more difficult. Once you get down to the state and local level, um, because there's so much variation. There's lots of different issues. There's lots of different um, you know, kinds of cases, and I think also, and this is where it's sort of the problem is in, people mistakenly think oftentimes that it's boring. Um, you know, you look at sort of the cases, uh, you know, at our, at our local levels, and it's like, okay, should we build a highway through this place, or should we allow um, X business to be built um, in the downtown, or something like that, and on the surface, that looks kind of, uh, you know, kind of kind of boring compared to, uh, you know, kind of the question Are you we had earlier. On zoning committee things? Well, yeah. I mean, compared compared to like, you know, is 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 uh, our our uh, Trump's insults going to get us into a war with Russia or something like that? You know. Um, so, uh, you know, so on the one hand, it looks like that, but the problem is, and this is where it's not boring, is that oftentimes those local things impact us a whole lot more. I mean, the fact is that whether there's a highway that tears through, you know, some local park or something like that is actually going to have an appreciable impact on your life, whereas. You know, Trump talking to foreign leaders, yes or no, you know, probably isn't going to really uh, impact you know you even ten years down the line here. Right. So we're uh, we're almost uh, close to the end here. So I guess I'm going to ask one last question for you, kind of in uh, enlightenment round fashion. Um, as we're as we're preparing to watch the debates, what are each of you looking for specifically? I'm looking to see. I mean, how this is going to be uh, framed. So the biggest thing about the debates is not really what it's what is said during the debates. But how it gets interpreted by the media and how successful the candidates, um, you know, sort of team is at selling their version of the debate, right? I think the bar is going to be set very, very low for Trump, which is to say that if he shows up and doesn't say anything really crazy, um, it's going to be called a win for him. Uh, I think for Hillary, one of the things that's going to be hard for her is is making sure that she's not interpreted as being shrill during the debates, um, and fairly or unfairly, that's what she's often um, labeled as, right? And so I think for her, that's going to be key: is you know, coming out with a tone that feels presidential. And again, I think there's probably a lot of gender stuff going on there that we could talk about. Um, but I think that's what they're going to they're gonna look at, those kind of things. 
uh, one of the things I'm really looking for is how, how, how well the monitoring is going to be able to uh, pin, pin Trump down on specific policy proposals. So we've seen a number of uh, you know, what he's described as softening or you know, sort of uh, movement on his, uh, his campaign in terms of specific policies. And so it'll be interesting to see if he can, uh, if the moderators especially, can actually manage to, to get him to commit to certain, to certain policy positions. I think, uh, I agree with both, both the gentlemen here, uh, I think that um, the moderators will play an unusually large role in this set of debates. Uh, Lester Holt, the first moderator, um, Matt Lauer was widely pilloried uh, last week for doing what was widely believed to be a terrible job interviewing uh, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Let's see how Lester Holt does. He's going to need to be firm and, and he's going to pursue questions with these candidates. And I also, um, you know, I, Look, look for uh, how these two candidates try to communicate with each other. Um, both, neither one of these candidates particularly likes to go back and forth in terms of debates. It'll be interesting to see if either one of them tries to engage the other directly, rather than just giving like, a dueling banjos joint televised press conference. Um, <laughs> All right, well, I think we're at our time here. Our students need to go to class, and we need to go teach them. So on behalf of my colleagues, I'm Chris Moore. Thank you for joining us for Lunch and Shot Therapy, and go Royals. Mm -hmm.